I'm Farhan Dalla, Transformational Trainer, and welcome to Elevate Your Life, a transformational podcast, an invitation to take the journey towards your deepest self. It is my intention to inspire you to connect, move, and meditate. We'll tap in, tune in, and dive in, and together learn and reflect from authentic, real, and transformative conversations. Let's get started. On today's episode, we are having a conversation about Islam and grief relief. I'm hoping that we can provide you with lots of insightful information that can help you in your own personal journey, regardless of your background. And perhaps this is an invitation to simply learn more about Islam and grief. We all may have more in common than we think. I hope today's discussion highlights how we are more alike than we are in fact different, as well as provide you with tools to help you with grief. My guest today is Dr. Shiraz Ismail. Dr. Ismail is an active family physician since 1973. He has volunteered in several community organizations in various capacity and is an active Islamic educator. He started a bereavement support group called Share and Care for the Ismaili Muslim community about 25 years ago. To me, he is also known as Shiraz uncle, a respected member of our family, and in fact, my mother's first cousin. Shiraz uncle, thank you so much for being with me today. You're very, very welcome, Farhan, and thank you for having me. Of course. Yes. It's, so, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to talk uh, with you as always. And uh, I, I really enjoy talking with you whenever I've had the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And this is the first time we're conversing over a podcast. So I'm excited about how this conversation is going to go, what we have to share and the insights that you'll be leaving with us today. But I want to start with the fact that you have a long history of a relationship between yourself and my family. And as I said, you are my mom's first cousin. And you also at times served as a physician, but not just for my mom, but both my grandmothers, my mom's mother and my dad's mother. And you also had a very close upbringing with mom. In fact, you, you shared your childhood in a very unique way. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that now. Hakun Baiji, as we used to call your mom, was very, very close to us. She still is, because I don't think they, they go away after they depart physically. Um, so she was, you know, I always look up to her. I mean, she was a little older than I, I than me. And when I was a little boy, she, you know, we, she would, I would admire her the way she would volunteer in Jamaat Khana with uh, Water Society. She would as you as you may know or may not know, because you you were born here. No, you were born no. in Tanzania. No, I was born in Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam, but, but you were young when you came here. Yes, but in Dar es Salaam, it used to be very hot and dry. And in Jamaat Khana, to have a glass of cold water was really a treat because most people did not have a refrigerator in their homes. And your mom would carry this big jug. She was a little girl herself. I mean, she was in her teens. She would carry all these jugs of water and serve water to all the people and they had this yellow and brown uniform she, and she looked very smart in that with little tie and all that and the water society as it was called so it was very refreshing and we learned that and and she was very regular going to the jamaat khana the prayer hall um, and it was a family tradition because her dad my uncle mamdali was also a very regular jamaat khana just as as well my dad was so we, it was a tradition to go to Jamaat Khan in the morning and in the evening. And I, being a little boy, of course, would go in the morning at 4 a.m. But your mom, my elder sisters, and your grandfather, that is Mamdali, they all went to Jamaat Khan in the morning. And then when I grew up, after the age of 13, of course, I started going in the morning as well. So there was a very close connection. And... Uh, there was a lot of religiosity, you know, the, your, your mom was a very religious person. But apart from that, I had another connection with her. She and I had this interest in botany or in, in gardening. And your mom was an avid gardener and she would always ask me for tips because I did 
uh, one of my uh, study of field of, field of study was botany. So I would give her tips on how to grow roses and how to uh, hybrid roses and things like that. So she and we had long conversation and and every birthday on 20th of January, I would try and give her flowers because I know how much she enjoyed flowers. Uh, so we had a very good connection and uh, I still miss her every every 20th of the month. I do think month. I do think of her. In fact, just this two days ago when it was 20th, I was thinking of Kathun Bayaji and said a special prayer for her, as I always do. Thank you so much for sharing that. And your living experience with mom was unique too. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And in a way, I was born in Nairobi because my dad had to move from Wadogar, the big house where every all the six uncles and the, their wives and everybody lived. So I didn't have that their childhood. But when I was about five or six years old, we moved from six years old when we moved from Nairobi back to Dar es Salaam. And, um, and it, was, it was during that time we lived in that house, but then the house was, we were all growing up, so the house was small, so we had to buy another house or rent another house near the Vadogar. So I stayed close. So I, at night we would all sit around our, our um, one of our aunts, uh, Babi, we used to call her. She was the eldest uncle's wife. And she had lots of stories to tell about the ghosts and things like that. Mm -hmm. And in Vadogar, as you know, was haunted or was supposed to be haunted. I've written several stories of these ghosts of Vadogar. Maybe I'll share them with you sometimes. Yeah, please. I, I'm definitely interested. Uh, those are stories it, my mom never told me. I, I, I yes, wasn't aware I don't think she would have told you because they all used to be scared <laughs> and listening to it. Yeah, so, you know, when when Bobby or the our eldest aunt would be telling us all these ghost stories, I would be wide-eyed and my younger brother Firoz would be wide-eyed listening to her. While Khatun Baiji and my other sisters, they would all be scared. So they would, you know, they would like listening to it, but they wouldn't want to repeat it. And then, then they would be scared and say, stop now, and they would go to sleep. But those were very beautiful times. And, uh, and there was a veranda where uh, the fakirs in Dar es Salaam or the poor people would come and uh, the food that was left over or the one cent it was a little coin that we would all collect to give it and your mom was part of that that she would uh, encourage us to collect money and give it to the poor people she was a very kind-hearted very generous very giving person and even later on when she got married she looked after your grandmother very well she looked after her mother very well um, she looked after her cousins very well because there was a family of cousins where which, which were needy and she was one of them who really really looked after them very well you yes. know the ones I yeah hope. caregiving is something that's definitely been modeled to me by her as well as my dad and i saw the way that she took care of my dad towards the end it was it was not an easy time yes. but she must have inherited these family values in this house, which you refer to as Wadogar. And Wadogar literally translates to big house. Um, how many people would you say were living at this house at one time? Like, what was the most? We're, we're talking <laughs> about my mom. At any given time, 45 people. 45 people. So my mom grew up in a house with 45 people that included her father, her mother. How many uncles did you say? Well, th there was seven brothers and one sister the sister got married so there were seven brothers and the eldest uncle got uh, passed away uh, but there were six other uncles and then of course then my dad was the third in the line we moved to Nairobi for six years and then we came back and there were also wild animals from what mom told me there were goats I believe and <laughs> yes well they were wild they were domestic there was a donkey that gave milk to me, and a donkey is wild. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a little like a donkey little... makes a household pet. But... <laughs> well, there was an orchard at the back. So we had fruits growing. We had zambrao and guava, you know, rose apples and guava. And there was a garden full of asmini jasmine plants, which they sold. Your mom and my other cousin, Shev, they grew this and they sold, sold those flowers. For uh, in the evening, the women would come or the husbands would come and buy them for their wives. 
So there was a business going on, and they were they also used to make bajias to sell, because, you know, with forty five people living in one house, money was always tight. So they had to improvise and make uh, other avenues to earn some money. And can you explain what bajias are to our non? Bajias are little fritters made out of beans. Mm -hmm. So they would soak the beans the day before, and then. Uh, grind them by hand, uh, you know, in a grinder, and uh, mix them with uh, spices, and then fry them and sell them. Very, very tasty bajias with coconut chutney. Wow, a family that had to do what it needed to do to to make ends meet. That that was a lot of mouths to feed. Yes. Um, and and thank you for sharing those memories of my mom. They 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 definitely um. It warmed my heart, so I appreciate that. But I want to shift gears now and, and talk about the bereavement group that you started for the Ismaili community 25 years ago. First of all, thank you for that. And, you know, I, I got to um, attend to one of the sessions when my dad transitioned, and I really appreciated the support as well as the words of wisdom that you shared in the group um, when I was there. But I'm curious as to what motivated you motivated you to start the bereavement group. Um, I think it was meant to be because I there, there's a little story behind it. Um, in nineties, there was a, a young man who had just finished his university. He was twenty four year old, and he he had a night job. His first job was as a night job, so he used to go at four a.m. Um, to work, and uh, and he was the only son. So his dad used to take him because at night the buses are not that frequent, so he would have to wait. So one winter night in December, um, he and his dad had been watching a, a game or something, so they'd gone to bed late. So at 4 a.m. when he was about to go to work, he tells his dad, don't bother taking me, I'll take a bus today because you're tired and you, you have your sleep. So he went down on Don Mills Road and uh, waited at the bus stand. Uh, for the bus, and a stupid drunk driver barged through the bus stand and ran over him. The father, who was at home, had fallen asleep again, heard his son calling him. So he ran down, thinking that he had forgotten his keys or something, or his lunch. He ran down to find out what it was. And when he ran down, he, he, he sorry, he ran to his balcony and he saw that the bus stand was crushed. So he ran down thinking that, you know, he was calling, his son was calling him to help somebody who's been injured. So when father came down and he went to the bus stand, he saw his son lying there. So this sight was, was horrific for him. And he was in a shop for about three days. Now I had attended this guy's funeral and I knew the father and the mother was a nurse. I knew her too. Um, but on the third day, when this guy came to Jamaat Khan the prayer hall, he was sitting with Mukhi Kamriyas when everybody had gone home. And I had gone late to Jamaat Khan that day. So it just happened that this guy was sitting with Mukhi Saib and Kamriya Saib. And Mukhi Kamriya knew, knew me as a doctor. So they called me and they said, come here and uh, we want to tell you something. And this guy was sitting there and they told me, you know him. And I said, of course, I know him. He says, this guy. He's saying that he's going mad and he hasn't, he, he doesn't know what to do. And I knew what tragedy had, had uh, befallen this guy. So he says, can you talk to him? And I said, yes. So he and I, I took him to the corner and I sat with him on a chair uh, together face to face. And I said, what's happening? And he says, I don't know what's happening. I'm getting crazy. So I said, why don't you cry? He says, they're not tears. They're so dry. I said, let's talk about your son. And I said, you know how handsome he was and he just, what, what degree he did. And once we started talking about him, the tears started welling in his eyes. Mm. Excuse me, I still think of it and it was very, very sad. And we both cried for a while. After that, he says, I'm feeling much better now. Can we meet again tomorrow? And I said, of course, and that day I went early and we sat together and and this time again he cried and, and I just listened to him and I 
And I encouraged him to just talk about his son because I didn't want to preach to him or anything. As you know, I'm also a lay preacher. I didn't want to preach to him, but it, the, and I didn't know what to say to begin with because he was going through tremendous grief that I had never been exposed to. And just listening to him was all I could do. And instinctively, I just listened to him. As a physician, I listened to so many complaints. So this wasn't a complaint, but this was an emotional overflow. I listened to him. And so for two or three days, I did. And then I thought that maybe there will be other people who will be going through saying this. So as I'm also a community leader, as you know, I knew of people who had lost their children or their husbands or their wives. So I approached two or three of them saying that, how are you getting on? And they says, you know, we say prayers. And also I said, can you come and meet with us? And I started a small support group. And that became a regular thing. And then instead of meeting every day, then we became once a week and then once a month as time went by. And uh, the group got bigger. And from Dawn Mills, it's expanded to all of Ontario, uh, Toronto. And then council, the social member of the council was also involved because anything like this, we have to inform the Jamaat, the, the members of the congregation about it so that we would be able to help more people. And it started and then I, I, the committee grew bigger and then we started incorporating psychiatrists and grief counselors and we started training support group groups. So from that little thing, it started and it's become a very organized big committee. I work as a consultant now on that committee, but there is a committee that, uh, that keeps a tab on everybody who passes away and we follow up, the supporters follow up. These are all volunteers who, who follow up with phone calls, trying to see if how people are getting on with their lives again. Are they going back to normal or are they going into depression? And if they need any support, then we meet with them. And we talk about the faith. We talk about what Islam thinks of death and how we have to carry on with uh, and what are the tools that we need to get over the grief that we are going through. We encourage people to grieve. It's not that we say grief is bad. Grief is a part of living. And I always have this favorite sentence that I say, that grief is a prize of love. If you did not love that person, you wouldn't grieve. So, so grief is a good thing. Yes. Yet, it's a positive thing. But to understand it in positive terms is what we try and do. I, I love how the opportunity to be of service in that way just presented it itself for you and how it's grown and the number of people that you've helped. What I love about this is how you were just present for that person. And for me and in, in my own personal journey, I think the, the greatest thing that anyone can do for me is just to be present and witness and listen and not necessarily try to offer solutions or fix or lecture, as you said to be witnessed and to be seen is the most important thing that I need. And it seems like the mo the, by doing that for this person, you really help them in their journey. And, um, and I know a lot of people have benefited through this committee because from my own personal experience, even with, with mom's passing, I've been getting regular phone calls and check-ins. And despite the fact that the pandemic hasn't allowed for personal and group sharing and caring events. It's continued virtually. People still meet on Zoom. There are events that occur about once a month for people who have recently lost a, a loved one and they can attend. And I encourage people to participate because I know that it can be of great benefit. And so thank you so much, Charles Uncle, for, for all your your seva, our service, as we say. And um, you you mentioned that you talk about the teachings of Islam and, and grief. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about that, please. Uh, our, our community is very religious oriented. So everybody knows, the, and whether you're religious or not, we all know that one day we will all go. So this life is temporary, but the esotericism in the faith teaches us that it is the soul that is eternal and that that soul is in a journey. 
So if you look at Quran Sharif, the, the holy book, you find that there is an ayat or a, or a line in that which says, you were asleep and death wakes you up, which means this life is a dream. 18, 90 or 110 years that we may live will still be a dream because it will be over one day. What is perpetual or eternal is the soul. There was a life before this, there is this life, and there is life after this. Now, this life has been given to us so that we can utilize it in such a way that our afterlife becomes better. And the ultimate goal in Islam is, there is another sentence called, Inna lillahi wa inna that from him we have come, and to him we will go. Now, it depends on what we do with our soul's journey, that our soul's journey shortens, and we become one with the universal soul, finally. So that is the concept. Now, having borne this in mind, I always tell them a story that is in one of our hymns, or Ginans, which talks of a, a guy who fell asleep on a bench. This was a poor guy, a homeless guy who falls asleep on a bench, and he dreams, and he dreams that he's so wealthy, he's a king, a sultan, all the maids and everybody is looking after all his needs. And suddenly he falls from the bench and a, a soldier is kicking him and saying, get up, you're not supposed to sleep here. So he wakes up and he says that, is this the dream that I'm being kicked by a soldier or was that the dream that I'm a sultan? So which is true. So one has to make choice of which dream you want to pursue. If you want to pursue your dream, to be of sultan, then you have to work towards it in this life. And if you want to pursue your dream as a poor person, then enjoy your life here and don't worry about it. So this is something that I don't give answers to, but I say that we should, we should all have to think about this life as a dream. And as a dream, all our dreams will end one day. So one, when, we, when the dream ends, this is what happens. Now for the bereaved people, those who are grieving, uh, we say that, you know, as I said, that we start, I start with, the, you know, grief is a price of love. And if we did not grieve him, if we did not love him, we wouldn't grieve. So then what do we do now is the question, you know, we miss them, we love them. We like to model our lives or take examples from prophets' lives to deal with our problems. Now, our beloved prophet also went through grief because some historians say he had three sons who died in infancy. Some say he had two sons who died in infancy. But whatever it was, he lost his children, his two sons, and, and, and how he dealt with it is what the, the anecdote is about. So I relate this anecdote, which is historically documented, that when Islam was being given to people by our beloved prophet, at that time, there was, a, there was a couple. The wife had heard the khutbah or the teachings of Prophet, and she had accepted Islam. The husband was still an idol worshiper. But the wife was so convinced about oneness of God or, or unique God that she kept nagging her husband every day that why don't you start believing in, in one God instead of all these idols? Finally, the husband to please his wife, said, yes, I will become a Muslim, and he became a Muslim, but he, had, he wasn't convinced in his heart. Unfortunately, what happened that one day when the husband was out, their only son, a teenage son, died. Now the wife realized that the husband, when he comes home, will be mad because he will think that the idols have, had cursed him, and that's why they lost their son. So she devised a plan. She sat outside her house and waited for her husband to return. When the husband was coming back, she started beating her chest and pulling her hair and crying loudly. The husband came running. She says, what happened? Why are you crying like this? She says, you know our neighbor. So the husband says, why? What happened? Did she come and hit you? She says, no. She says, what happened then? He says, 
you know, the pot we had borrowed when we had the party the other day from her to cook in because we didn't have a big enough pot. He says, yes. He says, she came and she took it back. So the husband says, is that what happened? He says, yeah. She said, why are you crying? She took the pot back. So the husband said, but it was her pot. She says, I shouldn't cry. He says, of course not. It was her pot. Why are you crying? So she says, okay, in that case, she made her husband sit down and says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given us a son and he's taken him back. So the husband got livid. He says, what kind of mother are you? You're telling me my son is dead and I shouldn't cry? I'm going to the prophet and I'm going to fight with him because I don't want this Islam. So he left her wife in a rage and ran to the masjid, to the, to the mosque, to see if he could fight with our beloved prophet. As he entered the door of the mosque, he saw our prophet getting up from prostration and our beloved prophet was crying. When he saw beloved prophet crying, his anger mellowed. And before he could say anything, prophet tells him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has just relayed to me that he showered special blessings on your home because your wife has understood the essence of Islam. When he heard this, the, the man started to cry and Prophet cried with him and, and he knew that Prophet knew what had happened to him. So he said, what do I do? I'm grieving. So Prophet says, yes, I'm also a father and I understand. But we have to thank God for having given us this time with this person we loved. If we hadn't become father, we wouldn't have known what was it to be able to have love like a father. So to have a mother, to lose a mother or a father or a son or a daughter or a brother or a sister, anybody or a friend, we have to thank God for the time he gave us with him or her. Had it not been, had we not had that soul connection, we wouldn't have at that time. So we thank God. And that is why in Islam, when we meet each other who, are, who is grieving, we say shukar. Shukar means we are saying, Thank God for giving us time with that departed soul. Uh, otherwise, our life would have been that much emptier. So once we talk in those terms and try to relate to people, that we all go through this. And uh, we never belittle anybody's grief because everybody grieves in their own manner. And, uh, and in this share and care, we start with... Uh, different stages of grief and we say that you know we will we may or we may not go through all these stages and we may not go in the sequence that elizabeth cobra rose has described but whatever it is we take it as a part of life and at the end of the day it is our faith our prayers that helps us get back get back to normality the other aspect of the grieving is also thinking of the departed soul and how we can connect. So prayers, of course, helps us connect in the spiritual world. We believe that the soul is in the spiritual world now, and the only way to connect is through prayer. So we say special prayers according to Islam for the, for the departed. And these prayers bring us solace and peace. And most people in the congregation do ascribe to that and they come back saying that by saying this prayer we are feeling more calm we cannot forget them and we never encourage people to forget so we say that's fine as long as you feel calm and you can get back to your normal life that is what the departed would want and that is what your life is all about that to go back living the way in whatever circumstance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be love that um i love the prayer piece because from my experience the prayers is a way in which i can support the, our departed loved ones through prayer but they also help me when i need to feel a sense of peace when i'm when i'm missing them and when i'm struggling and and going through the difficulties and one of the things that i I noticed is I often get asked, you know, how long has it been since your father passed away? Or how long has it been since your mom passed away? And so much of our focus is often on the time that we 
we've lost with them. But what I love what you're saying is that we should be grateful for the time that we actually had with them. And so for me, I choose to focus on not the times that I've lost with my parents, but the time that I actually got to share with them, because that's really what's most important. And the truth is, as you said at the beginning, is that no one actually really dies. And so we can't really count the days or the months or the years since somebody has actually passed because they've never actually left us. And so that time for me doesn't actually even exist. Um, stepping into the new relationship is a transition in, in so many ways. There's layers and complexities. You talked about the stages of grief, and that's part of the experience of that transition. But that connection to that new relationship um, is something I'm, I'm in the process of with my mom. Can you talk about how we could get through that transition? What, what are some of Islam's coping strategies to help us? That's a very good question. And I think you're already doing it without knowing. But, um, you know, there is, a, there is a proverb in Swahili, the language of East Africa, where it says, you're only dead when you to stop talking about, the person is only dead when you stop talking about that person. So as long as you talk about that person, he's still alive and around with you. And as you and I believe that people never dies, the soul is always around us. So when we pray, we feel the presence of the person, people who have departed. We feel their presence with the universal soul. So that all helps. But one way, one of the tools that we talk about in share and care and in, 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 in my experience that helps is to, to look at people and say that one of the things to do is to revive the memory of the departed in many ways. One, for example, to create an album with all the pictures and write the captions and think of the happy times. Now, why happy times? Because I always give this example, and it's a funny example, but people r realize that, that if you fall in a, in a crowd, in a mall or somewhere, what is your instinct? You get up and you start laughing, though you're in pain. So laughter decreases the pain that you're going through. So one of the tools when you're grieving is to laugh loudly like a mad person. And, and what happens is, scientifically, the chemicals that cause depression in the brain seem to be neutralized by, by the endorphins that are the happy chemicals that that body generates when you laugh loudly. So the pain feels less. So there's a scientific reason for it. And there's an instinct of laughing when you're in pain. So I give this example to people and people realize that it is a good thing to laugh. You shouldn't feel guilty that you're laughing at somebody you, who's, you've just lost somebody. You'll find that many times, and as you know, we, we all go to many funerals whenever we get a chance because it's part of an Islamic teaching to attend neighbor's funeral or anybody's funerals to pray for them. And after the funeral is over, there is somebody cracks a joke and everybody laughs as if it was the best joke in the world. And yet you've gone through a very hard time of grieving. So this is an instinct of how to normalize your emotions. And so the, in, in the tools that we suggest is one, to prepare memory book or to revive the memory, either, either as an album or to start a foundation or to start a support group. Number two is to laugh and to look after your own sleep hygiene, your, your, your body needs and things like that. Um, and you being a, a fitness instruction instructor, you know how, how exercising creates endorphins and how happy it makes a person. So exercising regularly. The third thing that, uh, that I encourage people or we encourage people in Care and Share to do is to create something that helped. For example, if your mother was a giving person and serving and helping other people, I'm pretty sure you're doing the same. And when you're doing it, you feel that your mother is helping you doing it. So I tell, we tell the people who are grieving that get into a hobby or into a work that, you, that the departed was doing, and you will find that special help that you need in that 
in that uh, occupation or, pur or purpose and it will help you. So, so there are things like this that we try and uh, tailor it to the person who is grieving because everybody has different needs and everybody who's lost their departed has had a different life. So it, it also deals, it comes with talking with them, listening to them, and then trying to suggest different tools of um, scoping with the grief. These were just the general tools that I described. Yeah, and all the tools that you've mentioned, I can relate to and have been practicing. Um, exercises, as you know, is an important part of my life. And I've channeled so much of the energy of feeling loss and sadness and all the emotions that one can go through at a time like this. And I channel a lot of that into my workouts and also finding ways in which that I could be of service, including making donations to certain charities that mom and dad supported throughout their lives and continuing by um, supporting them and carrying on with mom and dad's legacies that way and finding other rituals um, that I can create. And uh, one of the things that you know that I've done is create these beautiful portraits of mom with the dresses that she she loved wearing and, and framing them. And so everyone's rituals or practices or tools are unique, but uh, do you have any in particular rituals that you um, often practice to honor your family or, or loved ones that are, are departed? One of the ritual, I wouldn't call it a ritual, but I'll call it a, a, a practice that I do is to say a special prayer, a thusbi, a rosary for the departed. And uh, I try and do it every day whenever I can, uh, especially before I go to sleep or early in the morning after the prayers. I say a special thus before all the Ruhanis. And then I think of special Ruhanis too, who are very close to me, like my mom and dad, like your mom, and so on, who were a very intimate part of my life as growing up and so on. My, as you know, I've lost, we were nine and I've lost five brothers and sisters, so we're only four left now. So all these people are in my mind when I say these prayers. And I find that uh, that is at the moment enough in my life because as you probably know, that I have, I have, I'm wearing so many hats in the community right now that I just don't have time for myself to do anything else. And which is a good thing because Islam means living for others. The more you live for others, the happier you are. So that's another tool that we always try and uh, encourage people who are grieving to do is to do some kind of service to the humanity, whether it is just by praying for the departed or praying for people who are grieving or actively going to listen to them to ease their pain or bringing them food if they cannot do, do food or cleaning their houses or etc etc you know whatever way of whatever creative way you can serve the humanity is what we try and encourage people because by doing that you do forget your own pain the practice of prayer that you you described taking out the thusbi or the rosary is something that mom did every day before she went to sleep. And that is something that she taught me before she transitioned. And so that is a practice that, that I do as well. I, I take out a prayer or thusbi and um, recite special prayers for our Ruhani or departed loved ones every night before I go to bed. And that's how I end each and every night. Um, I wanted to also maybe touch upon some of your personal experiences with grief. If there's anything that you want to share in regards to um, your experiences with grief, if there's anything that you're grieving about at this particular time or you have in the past, and what was what is what has that been like for you, especially at this time in our world? Well, uh, one of the recent grief experiences that I went through was, as you know, I lost a very dear sister who was my nurse for 25 years in my office. And um, she was a very dedicated person in her profession and, and in the faith and all that. And she and I were together eight hours a day, every day, or more than that, 10 hours a day sometimes. 
very efficient. She used to do four people's job because after she passed away, I employed four people to cover up for what work she was doing. I hadn't realized that she was killing herself working for me. I underpaid her tremendously, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, wh what happened was that after she died, I was really missing her. And uh, I just wasn't feeling good. And this was a, a week or so after she had passed. I couldn't go face going to my office because I would miss her. She knew exactly what time I needed tea and what cookies I liked, etc. Everything was on my table. Anyway, so six or seven days later, I just dreamt that she came in my dream. And she was wearing a beautiful white sari. Now, she was married, but she was divorced at that time. And white sari in our tradition means that you're in a wedding. So she was wearing a beautiful white sari, looking very, very pretty and just smiling. She didn't say anything. So I woke up feeling better that I that she was trying to tell me that she was at peace and I shouldn't grieve anymore. And I just didn't think about it. Two or three days later, I had some friends who lived in Toronto and had moved to Timmins and they were her friends too. And she used to go and visit them and I'd gone to visit them too. So they, so whenever they had a major medical problem, they would come down to Toronto to see me as their physician. So this time, this this lady, her other two friends, and her husband, they all four of them came. Now they had to come primarily also to give me condolence because they had found out that Maron had passed away, my nurse. So they came and they brought a picture with her, with them. Now Maron, or my sister, never wore sari. She she was brought up in East Africa, where she wore short dresses. She went to England to become a nurse. She studied in England, and she. From England, she came to Canada, so she she wasn't uh, uh, orientated with the Indian culture so much in wearing saris and things like that. So to see her in white sari was a surprise for me too in the in my dream. Anyway, she this these four people from Timmins came, and they they you know gave their condolences to me. And after we'd finished uh, for medical problem that come, they said, we brought a present for you, and they gave me a picture. And they gave me a picture of Maroon in green sari. And I said, oh, she's in sari. She said, yes, when she had come to Timmins, she had helped us, How she had shown us how to wear sari. And that is how we took this picture. And I realized that Maroon did wear sari sometimes that I didn't know about. And she had come to tell me that not to worry at all. And after that, I didn't feel, I, I of course remember her, and I think of her, but I don't feel the pain that I used to feel. So I really feel that the, the departed can come in your dream and tell you what to do, but they only come when you're ready for them or they have a message for you or they just come around you and give you peace. They don't have to come in your dreams, but they, they do communicate with you in many, many ways as your guardian angel or as somebody who gives you advice, or you can hear their voice, or they can talk to you in your sleep, etc. So these things happen, and I think those things are personal. People don't like talking about it, and rightly so, because it's between you and the departed only. Thank you so much for sharing that. I I do remember Marinanti quite fondly when I used to bring mom or my, my grandmother to see you, and uh, she always greeted us with her warmth and um, always made us feel comfortable because, you know, sometimes when you go into a doctor's office, it can, it can feel a little cold, but uh, Marinanti always was there. And um, we really appreciated all the help that she provided us and our family. And I love that story about the sari and, and how our departed loved ones can communicate with us. Cause I do believe that too. I've certainly had, dreams in the past of my grandmother and my father as well and so it's great to know that um that relationship continues it may not be the way we want it to because we can't hug them we can't kiss them but they're still a part of our lives and in different ways and and that that brings me comfort so thank you for sharing that and so Cheryl and Gold, i want to i want to thank you today for not just this conversation, but for all the help that you've provided us over the years for my 
from my mother, my grandmother, and my family. I am so touched by the memories that you shared of my mother. And um, I want to thank you for always sharing your knowledge and your wisdom, not just with our family, but here today on this podcast. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time to speak with me and providing me with all this information that you've shared with us, hoping that our listeners have gotten some insight if anyone is struggling with grief. And um, perhaps this has also helped you broaden your knowledge about Islam, especially in regards to grief. Thank you so much, Shiraz Uncle. You're very, very welcome. And thank you very much for having me on your, on your podcast. You're so welcome. I'm Farhan Dalla. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's episode of Elevate Your Life, a transformational podcast. I hope today's conversation has elevated you in some way and inspired you to connect, move, and meditate. I'd really appreciate your support by following and rating this podcast. Come back soon and join me for another transformative conversation.